Um, but my name again is Kamika Kasten Miller. I'm located in Houston, Texas. And um, I'm originally from Dallas, Texas, um, which is was was traumatic in and of itself. <laughs> but anyway, um, with um, with that, I grew up in this um, part of, of Texas that uh, on the outside looks kind of very liberal and very kind of progressive, but on the inside has a lot of race problems. And so when I got out of high school, I, I wanted to go to, to Austin because I thought that that was where I really wanted to be, which is where I went to school and then made my way to Houston um, when I realized that's actually where I wanted to be. So I've been in Houston, lived in California for a year in San Diego and, um, and am back here in Houston now. Um, and one of the things that um, I fell in love with sometime when I first moved to Houston was yoga, became a home practitioner that was back in 2001. And then from there went into studio, was just doing yoga on my own for, for a long time, for eight years, I think I was a home practitioner. Uh, went ahead and um, became a, a home practitioner for a long time and then started to um, share the practice with young students when I became a classroom teacher. And then finally, after a really long time, became registered to be a certified yoga teacher. Um, for the longest time, I didn't become certified because I didn't think that I was the type of person someone would want guiding yoga in a room. Um, I didn't see anyone like myself in the room. I, I definitely was always the fullest figure person in the room. And nine times out of 10, I was the only pers the black person in the room. And so I, had, I think that if I would have not had those um, eight years of home practice, I probably would not have ever made my way into a studio um, just because I didn't I didn't see myself and not everyone's trying to be a trailblazer you know what I mean trailblazing's hard so I um, became a certified yoga teacher and what is crazy is that it happened at a time in which I was having um, a lot of pain in my hip or I had had a lot of pain in my hip it had been about five years and um, doctors weren't seeing me, they were seeing my weight. And so they kept prescribing weight loss to me. And what was actually the problem was I had a problem with my hip that I've had for since childhood. And um, because I was also a full figure person, it was always just attributed to weight. So I had that experience of not being seen. Um, and because of that experience, then I actually had to have um, hip surgery, um, you know, before the age or, or at the age of 40, um, which, you know, was pretty devastating, especially as a yogi, you know, we think that yoga will fix everything. But, you know, when you're not being seen and you're not being affirmed and you're not being treated, um, then it's really hard to have things um, or to, to, you know, especially when there are things that have been said to you over the years, um, it becomes tough to counter that narrative. So I took the, uh, my, my 200 hour training while I was in a lot of pain, which then lent um, the beautiful um, opportunity of having my entire training nuanced with um, yoga for pain management. And um, so all of everything, just like I became the modifications queen, I became the person who was like kind of challenging the norm and the ableist structures that were involved um, in teacher training. And, um, and then, um, and uh, just prior to that had begun my uh, yin and restorative practices. So that was about, uh, I guess it's been about seven years now that I've been in those practices in which I was able to find rest and able to find respite from, from pain. And I was like, there's something really special about these practices. And of course, moving the body helped as, as well, like active asana definitely helped, but certain practices started really hurting. And, um, but yin felt good, restorative gave me some peace. And, um, and then I started learning about the mind body connection and, and how, you know, a lot of pain is actual stored, you know, energy, stored memories, things like that in the body. Um, and so began to really step into that healing because I would have phantom pain still, 
um, which, which, you know, began to get me curious about what's really going on. So with all of that said, I've been in this practice, both of those practices for a very long time, also a Hatha practitioner and a practitioner of forest yoga, of course, the yoga works method and things like that. Um, and just really bringing a balance to uh, the young lifestyle with those um, yin small y practices. Um, and so i am become kind of a, you know, not kind of, I've become like <laughs> a, a stand for restorative yoga since then. Um, mostly because every single person needs rest but also because as a teacher, like training teachers to be restorative teachers trains us to be able to see people, to hear people, to affirm them in a way that oftentimes is not happening any, anywhere else. And if it weren't for my, rest, my first restorative teacher who was able to see beyond the superficial um, and was, was just seeing me, which is really what restorative teachers do is we just hone our ability to see people in ways that are very um, affirming and able to provide a support structure for them that is within our scope of practice. Um, if it weren't for that, then I probably would never have done teacher training. And I don't know that I would be the teacher or the practitioner that I am now, because I think I probably would have just given into the frustrations and things like that. So that is um, a bit about my story. Since then, I have trained um, many, many people um, in restorative and in yin yoga and um, have got, had feedback like, this, I learned more in this training in 40 hours with you than I did in 200. Um, I've learned this was the best practice. This is the best um, training I have had to date. Just things like that. And I'm not, I, I, I will, I, I will not uh, undermine my ability to teach by saying it's not me. It's the, it's, I will say I am, I am an effective teacher. I'm a, I'm a trained educator. I'm not no longer a classroom teacher, but I am a trained educator, but also the information is compelling and the practice is compelling. And um, one of the things that, um, that I do bring to the table is deep knowledge and awareness of the subtle body, um, which informs how we then teach restorative yoga and how we practice it, what is actually happening. Um, and, um, and then of course, being a, a, a trained teacher really helps to, to train other teachers. So to that end, I feel like, hmm, I've been talking for about 10 minutes. So now I want to know a bit more about, about you and what you're wanting to, to know why are you why are you here what has compelled you to be here and then we'll go from there in studio um do do studio owners see the value of restorative yoga sometimes sometimes you have a studio that is a power yoga studio that will have like one restorative class or maybe one yin class. 98% um, of the time taught by someone who is trained in neither or who had a, like a five minute long training in either of those styles. Um, then you'll have, um, and then you have the opposite of like studios that only are doing more healing modalities. Um, so you, you have that as well. Um, and I will tell you that uh, when people come to me for private classes, 100% of the time it is for it is for restorative or yin. It is never for for vinyasa or hatha. And you might you might have a moment where you're like, well, that's because you're not a vinyasa or hatha teacher. Oh, contraire, my frere. I teach all the styles and. Um, and I and I I am myself am an avid uh, hatha practitioner and come from a hot hatha background. People have sought me out for hot hatha because of the way that I teach it. Um, and so it's it's not that it's not that people don't know that I can 
they're going to come to me and they're going to get their, their butts kicked or get a good sweat or whatever they are. And they will. Um, what, and, um, and that's one of the kind of myths that got dispelled pretty quickly when I showed up on the scene and started teaching. Um, but it is because it is hard to actually find a good restorative teacher. It is hard to find a good yin teacher. And, um, and, you know, and I've gone on and I've taken, especially since the pandemic, have taken classes with a lot of different people because they're all out there and they're all available. And I'm telling you that there's a bunch of trash being taught as restorative yoga and a lot of it. And I feel super okay with saying that. Um, <laughs> there just, there just is, if you're ever in a class and any pose is held longer, less than five minutes, that is not a restorative class. If you're in a class and you're doing literally any kind of work besides setting up a, a bolster or a block, that is not a restorative class. Um, that is a gentle or, or a, a really, um, poorly executed yen class. So it's, it's not, it, when you're in a restorative class, you know exactly what you're in. And um, because it is, you're so, it's so different from life outside of that, that situation or that circumstance. Also, um, so first of all, so the private opportunity is, is substantial. And, uh, and the, other, the other thing is, is there are studios that are very specifically looking for restorative teachers for the very reason that I mentioned, that it's actually really hard to find really great restorative teachers. Um, you know, Judith Hansen Lasseter is my teacher and, um, and not everyone can study with her, you know? I mean, you guys in California, you have it great because she, you know, she lives most of the time there and she's at Yoga Tree. But most people don't have access to her. The one thing that is important about this training is the immersion because so many people haven't either had a legitimate restorative class or are still in a, in a nascent restorative practice. And so having a, a really great uh, experience is really important to me so that you know how to put together a class, you know, how to sequence, you know, why you're sequencing, how you're sequencing, et cetera, et cetera. And so you did mention that you have a love for yin and I want to just let you know that this is not yin capital Y yoga. This is a yin practice, lowercase y. Um, and they are very different. And fortunately, I teach and train both. <laughs> the, so I'll tell you right now what those differences are. The yin practice is, as, you, as I'm sure you've come to know, is about intentionally creating stress in the body. Um, understanding that we stress our bodies just by walking upright. And, and intentionally creating stress in the body, stressing the joints in ways that we would not do in a young class and, um, and uh, learning how to create resiliency in the body and creating sustainable bodies and mobility. And that's really what yin yoga is about. And for that reason, there's a lot of turning inward introspection that is cultivated through that practice. That is yin yoga. It is amazing. I love it so much. Restorative yoga is intentionally not stressing the body. It's actually turning off stress mode so that you can actually find rest and recreate it. It is using many props um, of which we have so many at home, um, which I'll speak to as well. Um, and we're using those props in order to find 100% comfort, not 98%, 100%. Uh, where the discomfort ends up living is that people oftentimes have never actually, or it's been a long time since they've actually just experienced rest, that it becomes almost scary, um, oftentimes scary. Uh, some things will come up for you that will never come up any other time because you've you've never taken the time to turn the mind off. So 
that happens, tears happen, but not because the pain, not because you've been sitting in frog for five minutes, which is a very typical thing that I do in my end classes, but it's actually because uh, you're sitting with yourself and facing yourself. And there's a lot that we are not facing until we have that opportunity created. So the restorative teacher becomes then this guide to an experience that's being, that is leading with the uh, end in mind of what is the person going to feel like both Crystal and Marianne have mentioned. Um, and without outcome, what, like without any attachment to outcome as well, because the experience is wholly, it's, it's holding space for that person. Now where yin and restorative collide is the energetics because we're working on a subtle level. Yin is working with the, the meridians that are correlated to traditional Chinese medicine um, that are meridians like kidney meridian, bladder meridian, things like that. And restorative yoga is working with other energy um, language um, like chakras, um, nadis, and, and having a knowledge of both of those things makes you a very well-rounded teacher. Um, we're in restorative yoga training, especially because this is a 50 hour training, we're going deep into the subtle body. We'll investigate the values, which is very rarely talked about in, in, in a 200 or 300 hour training. Um, we're going deep into that. We're going deep into, um, you will learn, uh, you'll have an introduction to guiding yoga nidra, um, uh, which is uniquely suited to pair with restorative yoga. And you'll be discouraged from just finding scripts online and you're leading something because you will know what it actually is. And you'll understand that that is a really unethical practice, even though it is done all the time. Um, and so you'll understand the a, a energetics that are behind not only uh, yoga in general, but why you like the practices that you're drawn to so much. I also want to just speak to two things, which is about mm, restorative by choice. So um, many folks have associated restorative yoga with like old people's yoga or the people who can't do handstands yoga. And um, uh, which is really interesting because there's it's very ableist and it is ageist and um, and it it has no place that mentality has no place in yoga. That's a very very Western way of thinking and seeing people. Number one, number two, um, restore um, restorative yoga is a response to the Western lifestyle. That's why we practice it so much over here. If you could guess how many, and you could just put it in the chat, what is the percentage that you experience stress on a daily basis? So anywhere from zero to 100%, like what would your average be? If you could just guess, just put it in, just type it or say it out loud. <laughs> Bethany's face is saying everything. Beth Bethany, your face is a whole mood. Um, all right, we've got some things, okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. So before 2020, the statistic is that we're in stress mode 70 to 80% of the time. That was before 2020. Now, I, and I say this a lot, Devet has taken my class before. Um, so she may have been here for this, for me saying this. If we are in stress mode 70% of the time, think about how you are when you're hungry, when you're tired, when someone cuts you off, when you're driving. You guys don't live in Houston except for Crystal. So you guys are already nicer drivers than we are over here. We are terrible. We're like the most dangerous city to drive in. But think about that, what that looks like. And 70% of the time, we'll go on the low end. I imagine you're around people like what? 50% of the time, 60% of the time. 
Maybe you're around people 80% of the time. Maybe you have a lover, a child, a pet. So that means that 70% of the time of the, of the time that you're spending with others is informed by stress mode. Or maybe it's 100% of the time because maybe it's you being around those people <laughs> that's creating the stress. Like Chelsea actually teaches her kids at home. And I'm just thinking, I hope you're doing some restorative yoga, Chelsea. I hear the background talking about snacks right now. (laughs) (laughs) And they're like, I need you. And people need you, right? Like Bethany had a whole mood when I said, how often are you in stress mode? So we were in that pre-pandemic. And now in this pandemic life, we are there chronically. Um. Another little just quick tidbit about stress is you ever sit there and you watch people go out like recently and they're at bars or they're in places like without masks or they're doing the thing or here in Houston, we have people like our yoga studios are open. So they're like, yeah, I'll go to a hot yoga and sweat and do Kapalabhati and all sorts of things like, and you ever just sort of like, WTF, like how, why, what are you thinking? Am I alone in that? I didn't get a single vigorous nod. Okay. (laughs) Okay, so the reason, there's an actual scientific reason. So in my spare time, I research neuroscience (laughs) because the true nerd right here. There is an actual reason it's, it's chronic stress. And what has happened is it has hijacked people's, um, people's frontal lobe. So research has now come out to say that grown people, you know, we don't usually have a fully developed frontal lobe until the age of what, 21, 25 is the debate. And grown ups are now having our frontal lobes hijacked by chronic stress because cortisol is going to the brain and staying there. And so all of our good good decision-making ability is going out of the window the longer we're in this pandemic. And um, and that, of course, means that, well, I won't say of course, but what's similar to that is being in a war zone. So all of those things that create the conditions for PTSD, we are also living in those same conditions. And it changes the way, it can change the way that the brain functions um, because of chronic stress. So what then is the disruptor to that? And the disruptor is intentionality. The disruptor is restorative yoga, is meditation. For folks that believe that it is only for, you know, this population or that population, it's because they do not have an understanding a basic understanding of how stress works in the body. And I also tell people like back in the day when pre-pandemic, you know, back in the good old days, pre-pandemic, you know, when I was like really working to, to lose, lose weight. So I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go hit the, you know, I'm like hitting it, you know, I was doing like all the things because yoga was no longer working. Um, one of the things that you'll know is the more you do yoga, the slower your metabolism. So like yoga just becomes like a nice gentle walk in the park once you're advancing your practice. So which kind of kind of is 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 not is not good news for folks who love <laughs> utilizing yoga to 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 for weight management. Um, and so it's like oh, I'm gonna get on. I'm gonna do um, I'm gonna do what's it called. Uh, uh, I forgot what it's called, spin. So I started spinning twice a week and I'm like, yeah, oh, and I had the hardest teacher and everything. And a month later I get on the scale because I was like, I'm not looking at the scale. I don't care what the scale says, get on the scale. Cause of course I cared. And a month later I lost like two pounds. And I was like, what? Sorry, I forgot y'all were in my ear. I didn't mean to scream that loudly, but I was like, what is happening? And so I was like, you know what, maybe I'm just creating more stress in the body. So I stopped full stop. I was just like, let me just see what happens. Up to my restorative practice to at first, it was just one day a week. So I upped it to two days a week. And, and it was like, mm, at best up to two days a week. 
reweighed myself two weeks later and I dropped like four pounds. And I was like, oh, it's stress. So also having such a young lifestyle, even if that looks like, oh, I'm, I'm sweating it out or I'm running it out or whatever, that's actually just more young. And one of the things that I always say is there's no amount of young to offset young. You have to have yin to your young. And that is how we're disrupting um, all of the young practices or all of our young lifestyles. And that is why people like Jan started meditating so much when the pandemic hit, because Jan has probably been in mindfulness practices for a while because Jan didn't say, let me go run a marathon. She said, I need to sit and meditate. So I'm betting Jan, you have more than like five minutes of experience in yoga. So <laughs> Jan's like, I need to meditate because she's trying to disrupt stress. And that is actually also what I did, Jan. I went straight to restorative yin and, and yoga nidra consistently. And that was my most of my practice in 2020. Um, and that is why I was able to build what I've built and it wasn't, you know, crippled by 2020, like a lot of other people were, because I had that balance. I, what I, I will tell you, I took young all the way out of my practice for a good six months and it was fine. So, um, so that is another thing just to know. I also want you guys to know two other really important things because I'm time is of the essence. And one is, uh, this relates to everyone who is on this call because we're all, or, or this class, this moment, this meeting, I hate calling them calls. Um, and that is that we're all living in a pandemic moment, which means most of us are at home more than not, um, especially if we are guided by Ahimsa, right? So we are uniquely suited right now to A, meet a need of people who we're already at 70 to 80% stress mode pre-pandemic and now living at 75 to 90% stress mode, which is crazy. Like imagine what that does in the body. How, how does the body cope with COVID if it's already in 80 or 90% stress mode? How can you even recover it, you know, from that? Um, so there's, there's that. So that we're uniquely suited to actually provide some really incredibly important tools right now for at, a, at an incredibly important time. We also are at home and there, are, there is no studio in the world except Kripalu maybe, which is my, 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 my school um, that has all the stuff. But at home you have all the stuff. You've got a sofa, you've got poops, you've got pillows. You, if you don't need, if you don't have blocks, who cares? You've got blankets. You have every single thing that you need and you have stuff you would never have at a studio. So you can do poses you could never do at a studio. So one of the things is in training, you learn all these great poses and then people are like, how, the, how do I ever actually teach this to someone? And the answer is always, well, when you have a private, it's like, no, now that we're at home, you can teach all of the poses to everybody and guide them all. You can practice them all on your own. You know, 15 minutes of instant Maui, which is essentially Viparita Karani variation, half legs up the wall, but legs instead on a sofa or chair with a blanket under your bum will change your whole life that day. And I, do it for the next two days. Viparita Karani, blanket under your bum, feet on a chair or sofa um, or poof. And just, just do that and see what life is like after that. 15 minutes though, don't do it 14. You have to do 15 minutes. Um, it's a little mini restorative class. Try and see if you are still at that really sweet number of 30% crystal put in there. That is a cute number, Crystal. We are nowhere near 30% except when we come out of a restorative class. Also, it takes around 45 minutes to elicit the response of, to turn on the parasympathetic nervous system. Sorry, I have something in my eyeballs. And um, in a restorative yoga class, you're gonna get there probably in about 25 minutes if it's done well. You can get there earlier too. So teaching people how to turn on the parasympathetic response, the, the rest digest response quickly is incredibly important right now. 
Um, if you have people in your life, you know, who are trying to get pregnant, um, while you would think being at home all the time is a great time to get pregnant, <laughs> being stressed all the time, is not a great time to get pregnant and it impedes pregnancy. Teaching people how to de-stress with that is very helpful. I have an, a whole um, uh, cli clientele of people who were trying to get pregnant and, and came to and, and went to the restorative practice with me so that they could, they could hold on to their pregnancies because there was a history of not being able to hold on to them before. And both one just had her baby and one must have just had her baby because I haven't seen her in class and she was in class every, every time. But one did a private, we did the private with, the, with, the, the, with both partners um, because if you're both trying to get pregnant, somebody's the fault, right? So, uh, it, it, you know, like they may not say it, but that, that dynamic is in the relationship. So both people need that restorative practice. There's that. And then the second thing I want to say only has to do with a couple of people in this class. And I want everyone else, I want everyone to take a deep breath when I say this, even Chelsea, take a deep breath. <laughs> so everyone take a deep breath. For those of us who care about um, equity, who care about teaching to everybody, who care about black and brown bodies, um, it is extremely important that each of us know that um, black and brown bodies in a yoga studio like to see other black and brown bodies. That's in a studio, right? Now, why? Because turn on the TV. When, are, when do we see ourselves there, right? Or, or it's the thief or it's the this or it's the that. There's just not the representation that's there. There's just a lot of stress. There's a lot, we already know that there's race-based trauma. I'm not talking to anyone who does not have access to the internet. Um, <laughs> so how then will you show up for those black and brown bodies if you're not a black or brown person? That's another thing that I talk about in this training. Um, you know, it's really important for each of us to know that we're all a part of a history and we're all a part of an ongoing dialogue that um, oftentimes is not um, told from both perspectives. And so, um, and uh, Dr. Gail Parker just wrote the book, Restorative Yoga for Stress and Race-Based Trauma. And so now there are going to be more, more BIPOC people who recognize that they need restorative yoga as a response to that because healing comes from within. Just like there's no amount of yang that offsets, that creates yin, there's no amount of healing from the outside that changes a paradigm from the inside. So that, that has to happen from the inside. And those are things that we also discuss is how to be equitable how to hold space for people who don't look like you. And that is something that is mi a missing piece of this, this dialogue that is being had in, in black and brown communities. If you're not aware that that conversation is happening, you probably need to know that that is a really big conversation um, in, in black and brown yoga communities. And, um, and for that reason, there are loads of trainings that have sprung up that are, that are like all black people or you've bastardized yoga or you're culturally appropriated yoga. So this is the right way to do it. And, and they're very, they're isolating for those folks who, who want to operate in equitable inclusive spaces. So this is an opportunity too, for you to learn how to be more equitable, how you can um, actually create inclusive practices how you can um, learn how to speak to that so that we can also meet the need that is out there that people are aware of, but they just don't know it exists. That's why I said to Devet that, you know, when she, her whole, she could have a whole studio that is nothing but restorative yoga in Jackson, Mississippi, and people will show up over and over again, whether it's online or whether it's in person, you will learn how to see people, hold space for them, give them tools so that they can actually mitigate life 
in this pandemic world and also reduce their stress overall. So when the, the, the poo does hit the fan, um, then they're, they actually have tools to manage it. Um, so that's, that's another thing that is, that we'll be discussing. I believe that yoga has forever been changed by this pandemic. I don't see going to the studio being a priority for the serious practitioner in the long, in the, for a very long time. Um, and, and as a result, practices that can be done more um, or facilitated at home are going to become more of a priority. And I also see people taking an opportunity to really learn about the philosophy of yoga and, and you know, the real stuff of yoga. And because of that, then they will, they will know that a lot of what um, is, is happening outside of that home practice um, is, is, is operating on a, on a superficial layer of yoga and in a superficial layer of the body. And so at, as long as this pandemic continues, people are going to, as Cecile said, get nerdy about the yoga more and more <laughs> and more and start like reading the yoga sutras or start, <laughs> or start like diving into the yamas and the niyamas and are going to realize that their whole yoga practice has never been about ahimsa for themselves. And while they might be a vegan and they've been practicing ahimsa externally, they have been not practicing it with themselves. And so they will learn that, oh, well, that practice looks like um, boundaries. It looks like being an, a, a yogi for social justice. It looks like, like this is what ahimsa actually looks like. And it also looks like not breaking my body to do something when asana is only one limb of eight, of eight of what yoga actually is. So I think that more, the more time people have to sit and study, the more they're going to start shifting. And of course we have people talking about, um, you know, like we know that there's a very popular podcast out there that kind of demonized uh, a lot of what is seen in, in yoga communities in the West. And the more that gets traction, the more these conversations are going to happen for folks who really want to study. And that's going to happen at home because it, it's not happening in yoga studios. And the longer studios are closed, the more people are going to practice at home and realize the benefit of practicing at home. Mm -hmm. All of that said, there's still not, there's no vinyasa practice like practicing in studio. But again, that's because vinyasa is a very different, is operating on a different en energetic level than restorative and yin yoga, which is very introspective. You don't actually, like people being around actually can, it's like, ooh, like they're, like I'm having a moment. I don't want anyone to see it. Like I'm in tears. I don't want anyone to see this. So you know, a lot of that intimacy that happens, which, which let me interrupt myself with saying this, when we are in person, so I do also teach in person, but I, that's because I have an outdoor shala. And so we, and I'm in Houston, Texas, so I can do that outside. Um, so we are in the elements. Um, and the folks who practice restorative yoga together understand that there's something very intimate happening and are stepping into uh, stepping into a bubble with people when they do that. So there's so whenever we do go back in studio, whenever that does happen, um, or in indoors into a studio, um, the people who come to your class are acknowledging that they're in a very uh, vulnerable space, and so. They're, they're already prone to be in a home practice anyway. I've um, encouraged people to invest in their own stuff since we were in studio, because okay. when you're on your mat, um, you're having an intimate experience. And I don't want my energy going into this prop that then I give to other people and then theirs is in there. And I mean, I, I know that sounds a little <laughs> woo-woo, but I'm, I'm here for the woo-woo if, it, if it's about that. Um, and 
you don't have to have a single block to practice restorative yoga. Um, you don't have to practice, you don't have to use a block you don't, you can do everything with blankets. I know a restorative trainer who only trains with blankets. Mm. So there's, so there is that as well. I give loads of options of what people can use and it never has to be a single block. Okay. It's easier if it's a block sometimes, but yeah. it's more comfortable. You know, there, there are options, but you know what you don't have at a studio is a sofa. So Okay. And, there, yeah. <laughs> and all of their, there are restorative standing poses that actually most people do with blocks in a studio, but at home we do them with the sofa or okay. a chair or things like that. Mm-hmm. And it's just I get it. mm-hmm. so much better. So much better. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank I will you. probably never practice restorative yoga in studio again, ever. That's where I am because I just have too many options, you know, even when I'm teaching it, like for me to have my own shala, I, I also have like all sorts of furniture and stuff that we can use. Um, and, and so subsequently classes have to be small, right? They, I mean, it's a pandemic, right? So it is, they are anyway, but I don't know how I'll be able to elicit the same thing. There's no wall that's gonna give you the comfort of a sofa. It's okay. just, it just doesn't yeah. exist. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. So I guess just to confirm things that we will be doing in the training one, 100% is immersing you in restorative yoga with daily long form practices. Um, you will have a deep understanding of the subtle body. And I mean, deep, I do not mean let's talk about chakras for five minutes. I'm saying, Let's, let's talk about this, this super highway of stuff that's going on and what does this mean and how does it correlate to you if you're a person who doesn't believe in chakras? How does this correlate to the person who doesn't believe in meridians? How does that, like, what is all of that? What are the actual connections, anatomical connections between the subtle anatomy and the gross anatomy? you'll also become better anatomists because restorative yoga is based on Iyengar yoga, anatomy and the biomechanics, not biomechanics as much, but applied anatomy becomes very important because we are very concerned with the alignment of the body. What is the spine doing? We're 100% concerned with the spine, which Jillian is another difference between restorative yoga and yin yoga. Yin yoga doesn't care about alignment. You just use alignment to get into the pose and then you let it all go. With restorative, we're confirming that you're actually resting in alignment. And in order to do that, you have to have a developed understanding and awareness of what anatomy looks like in front of you. Um, We'll talk about how to guide yoga full stop. It doesn't matter if it's restorative or not through and at this type of medium, how does that work? Yes. Okay. That's 100%. So I teach a class that that's called yin for renewal. And so it is um, not on this, Chelsea, don't say that I said this on here, but not, not through yoga works, but in general, I teach a class and it is a 90 minute class out of which about 60 minutes is yin and the other 30 is restorative. A uh, 90 minute yin class will like tear you apart. Like it's, it's a lot. Um, so yes, knowing both for me, uh, knowing both is very important. Also, I will tell you, Jillian, I'm not 100% sure that what you've taken in the past is yin. I'm not 100% sure that what you've taken in the past wasn't restorative because as I mentioned, there's a lot of people using words to monetize their teaching. And it's not actually either of the styles 100%. So it's very possible that what you can actually love is restorative yoga, but the person has been calling it yet. The primary difference between this training and a yin training is the actual immersion and the the pose breakdown and things like that. Um, The energetics, if, if were I training yin, the energetics 
talk is going is we're just going to go more into it in this training but we talk about that we don't talk about like meridians and things like that we take the type i take the traditional chinese medicine piece out of it so instead of going traditional chinese medicine and all that that is you get and that the that pose breakdown all the other things like the energetics as it relates to um the ancients uh, and and the current things that we know about energetics that is still in. So we were talking about enteric nervous system in both types of training, which is your your gut nervous system, things like that. Um, so yeah, so I, I definitely for me to to it's important to know both. I'm not trying to upsell you like I really hate it when trainers do that, but I will say that if you knew both, you'll be you'll be a better teacher. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, I think the other things I was just recapping was just learning how to teach to all bodies, like for real, for real. <laughs> learning how to sequence for a particular energetic response, learning how to um, sequence um, with minimal and maximum props. So what do you do if you show up and, no one, and someone has nothing? You'll know that all those things. Um, learning how to sequence for, for, even though the Yoga Alliance doesn't want me to say this, knowing how to sequence to reduce or to hold space for trauma, you'll you'll learn that too, uh, and and you'll learn what is your scope, because the truth is, is there are a lot of yoga teachers out there trying to like do psychology with folks, and it's outside of our scope. So how can you stay within your within the scope of yoga teacher? And, um, and, and pr provide those tools, those healing modalities um, without stepping into the realm of psychology or counseling and things like that. And how to protect your own energy while you're doing that. This, um, this, pra this practice is for the advancing or the advanced practitioner. It is also the you teaching is, um, you don't need to be a yoga teacher to teach this practice. You just need to be someone who holds space for people on a daily basis. So I've had teachers, counselors, um, psychologists, and people like that also take this training so that they were able to better do their job and give people tools. People who work with kids um, are really great for this training as well. Um, before I forget, because I'll get in trouble if I don't say this, um, we have, <laughs> I, if, if you do reserve your spot by uh, Sunday, you get a month of free yoga through Yoga Works. So that's awesome. Then you can go take all of the things that you see that are called restorative re yoga and start taking notes and talk about what your experience was, which just FYI, this is going to be homework anyway. So Take some classes and notate how they made you feel. And we can that uh, and based on and, or like what you were doing, based on that, were you in a restorative class or weren't you? And just knowing those differences becomes important. Um, also the early bird uh, ends um, next week uh, on Friday. On the 12th, yes. Yes. So um, there's no reason to pay more if you don't have to. I'm here for paying the lo least amount for everything. So do that. Like if you're on the fence, do it, make the decision before it's more expensive because I would love for everyone to come in during early bird and, and do that. Um, and, I, and I will say that if um, that, because it's over two weekends, you have an opportunity to inform the second weekend. So if you feel that you're not, you want a little bit of something versus something else, then there is some room to be able to give that to you. Um, there's not like, you know, uh, there's room, there's room for you and what you're, what you're really concerned with. Um, and for the things that, for which there is not room, I, I do have a, an assortment of, um, of things to, to share with you outside of that. And then the com continuing community beyond that is, is a whole thing that we do. Um, 
We do things in a way that you always can come back to the information and you get an actual manual um, so that you can print it out and you can always have a reference. So there's also that. So it is, it is, um, it is, it is 50 hours of material. And by the end of the, uh, by the end of the training, I can say that um, 100% of the time when I've asked people, are you ready to share this practice? Are you ready to guide this? 100% of the time they've said yes. I just want to let you know, you know, obviously I've been emailing you guys, but if you guys have any questions, you can feel free to email me. Um, and also you can set up a call with me if you have any questions that you want to go over. Um, like Tamika said, um, if you pay in full by Sunday, then you'll get that one month of uh, yoga works at home access. And then if you're not ready to pay by Sunday, and if you want, still want to take advantage of that early bird rate, um, like she said, by February 12th, that rate will be $8.99 and then it'll go up to $9.50. Please practice between now and then uh, if you are going to do it. If, if not just to be a balm to your spirit, <laughs> to also just see what's out there and to know, you know, how you, how that makes you feel. Um, take my classes. See if you like me. If you don't, don't take me as a trainer. 50 hours is a long time to spend time with people. Um, so <laughs> 200 is even longer. <laughs> so uh, it's important that you like your trainers and you feel seen and, and heard and, and all of those things. And if, if you don't like me, it's not going to get better. I got to tell you, you know, <laughs> so, um, but I teach restorative on uh, Sundays uh, at, at uh, 3 p.m. Central time, 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific or what's it? 3 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Central. And then I teach yin on Mondays and Wednesdays. So you can experience that too. And you can know what is the difference between both. Um, and I recommend, and if you're like, nah, I really want this yin, consider that Jillian, you really like work. And consider that the value of your time is not attached to work. Um, because in yin you're working still. Um, so just consider that rest is as important. And when, when the ish pit hits the fan, learning how to, to turn on healing mode is going to be real important. Um, so, so just, you know, submit it for your, for your consideration. Um, and uh, if you do, if we never see each other again, please definitely lie on the grounds, put your feet on the sofa, put a blanket under your butt and rest for 15 minutes whenever you need it. So <laughs> I hope I will see you again though. Um, and there, if you want to connect more, um, I'll put all of my, I don't know, Chelsea, do you tell them how to get a hold of me? I don't even know how this works. That is totally up to you. <laughs> um, no, do not find me. Um, yeah, no, I'll put that here. That's Instagram. You can message me here. You can go to my website, see if you like me. Um, you can go to my Facebook, Ashe Yoga Life. Um, so there's that, but the best way to actually see who I am is through my Instagram <laughs> and, um, and yeah, and take some classes. So and I hope I see you again. I hope you guys register. It will be worth it. That is my commitment to you. <laughs>